Hey there everyone, welcome to another Biblical History on the Go. Uh, today's Biblical History is going to be answering a very fundamental question in Christianity um, for just everyone, um, because a lot of Christians don't know the history because they haven't read their Bibles, um, or um, they're reading now and it just takes a long time to, to figure out, or you don't know where to start, um, or people who aren't Christian and who are curious uh, who is this Jesus character, at least, that we talk about in Christianity? Um, because there are multiple ideas of who Jesus was uh, based on your religion. Some some religions accept that Jesus was a person, uh, but then they don't accept certain things about his life, um, which changes completely the character of Jesus and, and who, he, who he said he was or who he could have been. Um, so we're going to jump right into it. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, the first book in the New Testament, um, this gives you the answer. Um, and specifically, what it, go, what it does is it, it, it gives you that list of names that everyone dreads whenever you open a Bible and you see, ah, this person begat this person begat this person begat this person. And it's just this long, drawn-out list. So I'm going to explain why that's important. Um, for one, uh, the book of Matthew is important for the Israelite people because the Israelite people identified their their um, their genealogy based on who gave birth to who uh, and they trace this all the way back to Adam um, and and it's important to them because of the fact that they were constantly under siege because they had two exiles and the only way they'd know who people came from and where they were is because they meticulously kept track of their uh, genealogical records um, so this is there because Jesus claimed to be the son of David. Um, more specifically, he claimed to be God, uh, at least the Christian version of Jesus. Claimed to be God, uh, and that is why he was crucified. Now, if you look at the verses, and I'll put the verses here as well, um, he doesn't say, hey, I am God, uh, but they asked him. The, the Jewish people were constantly harassing Jesus, trying to figure out, like, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Because they recognized, they knew that the Messiah has to be God. Um, and, and, and they still believe that today, but the Jewish people back then who were corrupt, the Jewish, um, uh, what is the word for it? The, the, um, the authority, the Jewish authorities, uh, were corrupt and, and very much desiring to maintain their own power over, uh, the, the city, over the people, um, which is why they decided to have a, a king in the first place because they didn't want God to be their king. So when Jesus uh, shows up and uh, is, people believe that he is the Messiah because he is, um, and then he, he, they start to realize he's also got the power of God, uh, and they don't. Um, they start to get worried because of the fact that he might take their position. He would take their position uh, because he, being God, would then rule over them, and they would no longer have the things that they've desired uh, and that they've achieved, uh, namely riches and women, uh, which shouldn't have been the case in the first place, uh, but but that's what they did. They exploited their position as priests of, of the nation of Israel, um, and they did many horrible things. And that that's not just in Jesus' time. It goes back even further. I remember one instance, there was a story of this woman who was promised by her um, her I think it was her uncle um, for that that she would uh, that he would find her a, a husband uh, because she she didn't have anyone and she didn't have any means to, to get a husband and in that time uh, in the Israelite culture uh, that meant she didn't have any any um, she didn't have any money she didn't have any resources to maintain herself um, or her life. And he he just kept kind of kept ignoring her, uh, but this priest in particular was known to go and find prostitutes, and so this lady um, disguised herself um, and went to a place where he she knew he would be, um, and essentially prostituted herself uh, to her uncle, um, and at the end he she managed to get him to give her his ring. And, and then she went back later and threatened him with it and said, um, you know, essentially you think you're so high and mighty, um, but I have your ring. Uh, that was me 
not some random prostitute and I will destroy your position if you don't give me what I've asked for. Um, and so he did. Now, that's, that's a horrible story. Uh, but the point of it being in the Bible isn't that the Bible is something that's supposed to be fluffy and happy. It's the story of an actual culture um, of, of people who repeatedly rejected a good God who, who saved them from a lot. Um, and, and how they continually turn away from him and seek their own wicked ways. Um, now, this is the story of humanity as well. But God doesn't put that same judgment on humanity that he put on the people that he called his own. Um, now, why does God call those people his, his people? That's, that's why the Bible also says this is his peculiar treasure. Now, it isn't necessarily that God favors these people um, over everyone else in the entire world and that he would not love and protect everyone who puts their trust in him. It's not the case. Uh, we see that in the Bible as well um, as he protects people who are outside of the Israelite camp who believe and trust in God um, and whose stories are not in the Bible because they aren't about the Israelites. Um, although they, they interact with the Israelites here and there, like for instance Melchizedek or um, this guy's name it started with a B. Um, during Moses's time, though, was this this prophet of of another nation that came against Israel as they tried to enter the Promised Land, and their king was like, "You need to go and curse the Israelites because we know you have power." And he's like, "No, my power comes from God. Uh, this is the same God that's protecting them right now. I can't do that." Um, and so, so we, we see it's it's not about specifically about like favoring a, a group of people a certain culture it's it's about who trusts god they get favor from god um and the israelite people their their um the congregation is punished for the decisions of the leaders you might think that that's uh, a bad thing however this is what the entire congregation of the people of the israelites chose um in, in the very, not in the very beginning, but in, in the, um, when they first got their, their king, which was Saul, the first king of Israel. During that time, they decided they did not want God himself, the father, to, to rule over them. They specifically said, we do not want God. We want a man to be king over us. And they said, that decision would be on us and our children. This is what they chose. As a congregation, the, the priest brought them all together and said, God says, this will not end well. If you have a king that is human over you, he will exploit you. You will lose your, your um, you'll, you'll lose everything you've got, everything I've given you, because you'll end up turning away. Multiple times this priest pleaded with the people and in the end, they said, no, we still don't want God to be our king. We want a man. God himself, multiple times in the Old Testament, and also from the words of the prophets, prophets who were alive during the first and second exiles of Israel, both talked about this. Um, and they specifically were given words from the mouth of God, saying that this was the single worst thing that the Israelite people did. They rejected God. Um, and as a result, they would find themselves amongst destruction and judgment. Um, and they did multiple times. But then God sent exactly what they wanted in Jesus. He sent a man who is also God. A perfect man. Um, and, and this is where people kind of get confused. How is he completely man? He's also completely God. He's man because he was birthed by a woman. Um, so that makes him imperfect, right? No, his, his father is God in heaven who created a being, a person in Mary. Mary was chosen because she was the most righteous woman uh, in that age, uh, even though she was young, which also says something as well because God does not choose the, the older people typically um, to do his work. He often picks the younger people. Why? Because people associate an older person as automatically being wise, and often they were the fools. Uh, so God would pick people uh, who who would not be necessarily respected in society um, by having 
visions or, or, or dreams or um, words specifically from the mouth of God, nobody would believe them. Why? Because they're a child, because they're a woman. Uh, God took these stereotypes, these discriminations, and he used them against the people constantly, and he still does. Um, because people are, are flawed, and they put their trust in other people. Um, and God's trying to tell you, no, don't do that. Put your trust in God. So if you don't, if you can't see God, if you don't, if you don't interact with God um, on, a, on the day to day, as no one really does. Uh, and you can say you pray, and whatnot, but sure. But God's not not always giving prophecy, not always giving some kind of revelation. Um, so how would you know if God is speaking to someone? Um, and this is the problem. It's a problem today. It was a problem then. How people. Uh, believe that because someone is older, because they're a priest, because they're a pastor, because they're an elder in a church, they automatically are like they, they've got this kind of special, super secret connection with God, and and they're they're old and wise, and everything that their eyes see is 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 heaven. Um, but no, that's not the case. Um, now that's not to say that uh, old people cannot be wise and that they can't be, um, you know, actually you know communicating with God. Um, but to assume that. Is a very dangerous thing, and you have to be, as the Bible says, you have to you, be, you have to be able to test the spirit to know if it's from God, and nobody does that anymore. Um, I say nobody because, you know, well, at least half the church, um, most of the church, does not do that. Um, they just don't. They just assume, oh, this person is a pastor, so they must be righteous. Um, now, atheists, agnostics, people who don't believe in God, um, they're often wiser in this regard because they don't just accept that because somebody is a pastor or a leader that uh, they are automatically connected to God and that's how everyone should be especially in the church um, and the problem with that is uh, that these people who don't believe that who don't accept it right off the bat are also very close-hearted and close-minded when it comes to um, accepting or, or understanding or seeking any extra information because they've been wrong by the church or because they've seen someone else who have been wrong someone they care about who's been wrong i've experienced that myself i've experienced the the wrong being done to me um and i've experienced it uh being done to other people as well um now this does jade you from the idea of going to church because often you'll see it in just about any church you go to it's very difficult to find people who are actually living up the word and not simply trying to add numbers to a congregation as the bible says um you know making the those people who they drag in just to make them new converts twice the child of hell as they are they the people who brought them into the church um and and it's a it's a dangerous statement but it's it's true and you know it's come straight from the mouth of jesus so it's something that we should be considering um so if you don't believe in jesus you don't believe in god um i don't care uh if you want to go to hell i don't care whether or not you go to hell i don't care um it's got nothing to do with me my job my job is simply to tell you what you need to know so that you can't at the end of the day um at the end of the age and judgment say oh i've never heard that but i did come across somebody who claimed to be christian and they never told me i will not take the blame um i will tell you everything that you need to know and if, you, if you're hearing this video uh well there you go you you've got the opportunity if you turn turn it off that's still your choice um if you hear from somebody else and you deny it, uh, well, that's also still your choice to deny the information, to, to refuse to look at the evidence. Uh, and ironically, you probably consider yourself a scientific mind as well, uh, who refuses to listen to anything other than what you believe, which is uh, hypocrisy. So back to Jesus here. Um, that's, that's why the Israelites had this genealogical stance, uh, because of the fact that they needed information they needed that 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 tie from person to person who, who gave who begat it's a, a big word used there uh, which simply means uh, that these two uh, created another person uh, and often it's in reference to the father because they're it's a patrilineal society this is how they identify their kings because their kings were not women um, they had queens and often those queens were the real power behind the kings um, but the king has the authority. Um, so 
that's how they would track who came from where, what tribe you were part of, because certain tribes, or every tribe, had their own um, their own birthright. By being born into this tribe, this is your lot. This is where you live. These are the benefits that you receive, and you don't receive the benefits of multiple tribes. Um, so, so how did that work? Why why does why is it necessary for Jesus? Because Jesus claiming to be God, claiming to be the son of David. Um, has to have a tie to that line. Otherwise, it's just words. This is entirely for the Israelite people. So when you see those lines of people saying, this person begat, this person begat, this person, that's what it's trying to do. It's trying to show you from, from probably from Adam, mostly from Abraham, um, this, is, this is the line of people. These people gave birth to these people. You can see it for yourself that this person at the end that they're talking about came from this line, came from this tribe. Now, David is the king, uh, the, the second king of Israel, the, the first uh, and so far the only righteous king of Israel, uh, other than Jesus, but human. Um, and God, the father, promised that he would preserve the line even though he was going to separate the nation of Israel. Um, this is where uh, I've spoken about this as well in another video about the, the Antichrist and how to know who that is, the riddles um, involved. I believe it's the Whore of Babylon and um, the riddle of the, the eight kings. Um, but go back and check those videos. But this riddle basically says um, five are fallen. It's referring to the kings. Five are fallen. One is. Um, one has yet to come. When he comes, he, he'll, um, he'll be there for a little while. And then the eighth person, the, the eighth king, is the Antichrist. Now, this was a prophecy given to Daniel. Daniel asked God, why have you told me about this stuff? When is this stuff going to happen? God said, shoo, shoo, shoo. Uh, this isn't for you. Just write it down and go on with your life. It had nothing to do with David or Daniel. Uh, it had everything to do with right now. It had everything to do with the Antichrist, or the end of the age, the last people. Um, God, knowing that he would preserve this text so that someday we would get it. And now here... Um, thousands of years later because we've already dated these books um they go back to bc we know that these people actually existed we know that they actually wrote these things um whether or not you believe it is a different story but the fact remains that thousands of years ago some of the most ancient texts we know that these things were around and they were very very specific um and they are translated so it's worth considering so this prophecy essentially says five are fallen. Uh, what does that mean? It means that five kings are dead. Uh, people fall in battle. It's like an old earth kind of um, saying, but it's it's consistent. Uh, so if you look in the Bible, like people, they fall in battle. Uh, it means they're dead. Five are fallen. One is. What does that mean? Uh, even even in our recent history, people would talk about their children as. Uh, those who are and those who are not. This is also a, a common saying in the Bible um, where those who are not are those who are dead um, and those who are are those who are alive. Five are fallen, dead. One is. Now, you have to consider this because it's saying in the past then, one king is alive. Uh, at the time of Daniel, that was not the case. They killed the king. The king was not alive. Um, so five of the kings, let's, let's, let's go into the uh, history here. The first king is, is Saul. It's the first king of, of Israel, um, who didn't want to be king, uh, but the people forced him to be king because he was tall and he was handsome. And they're like, yeah, that guy looks like a king. We'll make him king. Um, and then he was corrupt, uh, corrupted by people, by, um, power. And he, he fell away from God. Um, so God took away the kingdom from him and gave uh, David, who was not Saul's son, but God appointed David as king. Now, David uh, eventually gave birth to Solomon, the richest king who ever lived, the richest person who ever lived in history. No one at all in any amount of science or social science will ever tell you that Solomon was not in existence, that he did not exist. Everyone in the entire world, in ridiculous amount of uh, extra biblical accounts, point to Solomon as being the richest person who ever lived. We know the nation of Israel was around before Palestine. 
um, before before the the Palestinians today this whole West Bank issue um, they were there uh, the the issue today is that the the Israelites recent history uh, were allowed to come back um, and now everyone's upset about it um, so Solomon richest king who ever lived um, and the wisest king who ever lived um, came next he was the third in line Solomon disobeyed God as well, and so God eventually split up the kingdom. Um, so Solomon had another son who was king, uh, briefly because he essentially usurped the throne uh, when Solomon was kind of on his deathbed. Um, now Solomon had another king in mind, uh, his other son Rehoboam, and this other king, I believe his name was Absalom, stole it from his brother by essentially rallying up the nation and separating them uh, and similarly to what Donald Trump has done um, and, and using that 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 separation of people who, who worked in secret to uh, to ordain him as king Solomon hears about this um, and he gives the authority to uh, to Rehoboam who should have had the authority in the first place um, and he goes and he takes the throne back. Uh, so there's, there's this Game of Thrones kind of thing happening here. Um, and he doesn't kill his brother, uh, but he threatens his brother and tells him, you know, don't ever try this ever again, and you're not allowed to leave the, the, the city because of what you've done. Uh, we don't want you to try and, you know, rally the people again. He eventually does try to leave again, and he is killed for it. So... That was the fourth king, Absalom, the one who stole the throne. And then Rehoboam. Now, because of Solomon's um, disobedience, God promised that he would split the nation of Israel in the days of Rehoboam, not in the days of Solomon because of all the good that he did do. Um, so Rehoboam dies. The nation is split. Or uh, the nation is split because of Rehoboam because he was uh, not wise at all and he chose the younger hipper crowd to be his advisors as opposed to the people who've been around who knew everything and the people didn't like it the nation was split into judah the land of judah which is modern day israel and the rest of israel which is the rest of the middle east um the bible makes it clear in uh deuteronomy when uh, joshua uh the israelites come out of egypt and they start conquering uh, in the nation and it tells you from sea to sea they conquered, and it tells you which spots were were which tribe. Now they didn't conquer all all the spots, but God ordained them to have all the spots, and all those spots went all the way up to to Turkey uh, and passed um, up to I believe the uh, the Gulf of Oman. Um, so what happens next is we've, we've got the death of the king and the nation split and the exiles so there were lots of kings that came after Rehoboam none of which were ordained by God God split the nation and he said I will keep uh, I'll preserve this line uh, in Judah and I will bring you another king one king who will rule over all of you this, he calls him the son of David David's already dead uh, so in order to be the son of David he has to be a descendant of David that's that's how that works not the literal son of david and it's not david uh who will sit perpetually on the throne it's david's line who will sit on the throne um but none of the the kings that came after were ordained by god um and specifically god says in psalms they have set up many kings but none by me so god ordained five kings five are fallen they're dead one is which is jesus the next king to come now the problem is when Jesus showed up claiming to be the king because they put it on his, his crucifix uh, king of the Jews uh, if he is the king then he is the next one in line the one who is um, but the Jews refused him um, and for being for claiming to be God uh, when they finally got him to to say yes this is what you say is correct um, they crucified him they killed him because they did not want him to to be king um and of course being god he raised from the dead but he there was a strategic plan in doing so in dying 
he not only died for the nation of Israel for their sin, but he died for everyone's sin throughout history, past, present, future, and as people who aren't even alive yet. Um, Jesus died for all sin, so that sin cannot separate you from God. If you put your trust in Jesus, if you believe that Jesus was the Son of God, is the Son of God, uh, if you believe that he is God and that he has a power to separate you from sin so that you can still get heaven being not perfect, then you have salvation. It um, doesn't matter um, you know, how crappy you are as a human being, um, God will judge the heart. Um, and, if, and if you believe that he is who he is, uh, that he has the power to save you, uh, then you are saved unless you want to try and use that as a, a means to exploit humanity to do whatever you want um, and 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 just think I can I can do whatever I want and then when it comes to the end um, God will just accept me you're on your way to hell because um, God he's not fooled so that's that's a matter of salvation Jesus is that sixth king who is so who's the next king uh, there's two kings left and that king is the the um, the one who lasts for a little time uh, and then the eighth one is the Antichrist um, now it, it's it's unclear whether or not the Antichrist is there already because the Antichrist um, the Antichrist is one of the eight right uh, so maybe he comes to power maybe he comes to power again doesn't really matter the fact is um, the only kings left to come into power in Israel um, are two people and one of them is the Antichrist um, Israel doesn't currently have a king, uh, but they're kind of setting up to, to have a king. And, and it's looking like Donald Trump because of everything that he has been saying. And if you look at the way that Israel is treating him currently, they're, they're idolizing him. Uh, they, they're putting him on their money. Um, they've named the railroad that they've created from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem after him. Why into Jerusalem? Because that's the nation's capital now. Why? Because of the whole religious factor. Um, and they will probably start building a temple soon. So who is Jesus? Um, he is, he's the son of God, according to Christianity. Um, and if we look back at that, um, that lineage that was given, um, you see it goes from Boaz, um, birthed by Ruth, or not Ruth, Rahab. Rahab was a, a prostitute in the, um, in Jericho, uh, who was not an Israelite. Um, but she saved, she kept the, uh, the spies from Jerusalem, from Israel, the nation of Israel, from being caught. And as a result, when they took over Jer Jericho, they saved her and she became part of the Israelite people. She was accepted. Um, now, from her and an Israelite, uh, they gave birth to Obed. Obed um, married Ruth, who was another exile of her of our culture, um, who was um, married into the Israelite family. From Ruth came Jesse. Jesse is the father of David, David, the king of Israel. Then David gave birth to Saul, or through David begat Solomon, right? Begat um, Solomon, uh, his other sons, uh, but more specifically Rehoboam, the last king. From Rehoboam, the nation was split. At this point, it gives you a list of the kings of Judah, because there are the kings of Judah and the kings of the rest of the nation of Israel. There's this whole power battle there, and then eventually the exile. And even tells you at this point the uh, the nation was carried away to Babylon which was the final exile before they lost the land until recently. And, um, and then he, it, it goes on, and then these people eventually gave birth to um, to uh, Joseph. Uh, not Joseph. Um, yeah, Joseph and Mary. Uh, so, so gave birth to Joseph. Um, and Joseph is... Was it Joseph or was it Mary? I'm not sure, but you could check it. Check it. Um, but basically, Joseph and Mary being the the, the parents of Jesus. Um, so from there, it shows that Jesus goes back to the line. His his family goes back to the line of Judah, which goes back to the line of David himself, making him technically as it makes everyone who is uh, birthed from that line of David a son of David, right? But only this one. Is the, is the ordained king of, of, um, of Jerusalem by God. Uh, so that's who Jesus is in, in terms of, of Christianity. He is uh, the savior of, of the entire world. He is the king of the Jews, the king of the world, the king.
king of all nations, the king of kings, as it's called in, um, throughout the Bible. So who is he in other cultures? If we take Islam, for, for instance, uh, in Islam, uh, they believe that Jesus existed, um, but that he was not anything more than a good prophet. Most other cultures will have this uh, to say about, or religions uh, have this to say about Jesus, if they include Jesus, that he was just a prophet. Now, if Jesus was just a prophet, uh, then he could not have been blasphemous. If he was not blasphemous, then he could not have said anything that he says in the New Testament. Um, he can't claim to be God. He can't claim to be the way. He can't claim to have existed longer than anyone else in the world. Um, so he cannot be the same Jesus. Um, that's just the bottom line there. Um, now, other people would say that Jesus was just a crazy person. Acceptable, sure. If Jesus was crazy, then we have to consider Christianity. How did it persist? Because if a person is just crazy, of course he's saying he claimed to, that when he died he would raise again in three days. Um, if he was crazy, he would have died and not raised uh, in three days. And so he'd just be a crazy person who, for whatever reason, happened to know all scriptures and be able to, like, he's just a genius who happened to be crazy. Um, sure, we'll go with that. Um, but, but then... The problem is, once he dies, and people see that this crazy person has died and there's no reason to follow him anymore, why would they choose to continue to perpetuate throughout the entire culture, to continue to perpetuate this idea that Jesus actually raised from the dead, knowing that they have the entire army of the Israelites and the entire army of the Roman people seeking to kill them for that testimony? Knowing it's a lie, why would you perpetuate that? There is absolutely no reason for that. If you're going to even go and buy like, the, the, the laws of evolution and self-preservation, um, nobody would do that. No one would perpetuate something that's a lie to death, the death of their families, the torture and the murder of, of all, all the people that they love to perpetuate a joke. Um, and for moreover, these people would, like the, the disciples, like this would have to literally be the the... For whatever reason, a group of massive geniuses, all born into the same time period, who decided to create the most elaborate hoax in all of history. So much so that they would die for it and, and manage for it to persist. Now, um, in anthropology, uh, there's this idea that if you if you were to kill off everyone who believes in a religion, um, then you know, give it a thousand years and that religion will be completely gone. Um, they tried that with the murdering the Christians and uh, it didn't work. Thousands of years later, there are still Christians. Um, so that just goes to show you, you know, this this is, it's, a, it's, it's legit. Something actually happened. Something had to have happened uh, for Christianity to persist. <sighs> so... talk about, uh, which, which group you talk about, um, means something different to everyone. Now, Jesus is really only relevant in Christianity. Um, now, no historical um, archaeologist, anthropologist, etc. will claim that Jesus did not exist. The only thing, the only people actually in this world that claim that Jesus doesn't exist are Americans um, and, and the American atheist society claim that Jesus doesn't never existed, uh, which is, is stupid. All the evidence, both biblical and extra biblical, claims that there was a man named Jesus who was crucified and that people believe that he was God. Um, the only thing that you can uh, deny or, or um, argue against is his divinity. It's just the same thing with the Bible. But then again, we don't argue divinity over you know the ancient Maya. We, we don't say, oh, well, you know, they believed in, you know, Quetzalcoatl and, and the, the sun, if, it, if there was an eclipse, that they had to murder somebody and cut their head off in order to keep the world living. Yeah, we know people did that. Um, and their writings are very similar in that they wrote that the gods were the ones doing this. Um, we don't say that they were stupid. We don't say that they were crazy. Uh, we say this is what was going on in the culture. They believe that this was what was happening. So let's look at what they said 
analyze it and figure out if we can figure out wh whether what was actually going on or whether or not there's any credence to their practices. But when it comes to the Bible, we say, no, it's stupid, don't, don't look at it. That's, that's hypocrisy. Um, so, Jesus. Jesus is the most controversial figure uh, in the world because of the fact of what he represents. He is either God representing a being that created everything outside of time and space uh, who can step into time and space at any point that he wants. Past, present, future. Um, and, and he ultimately controls the fate of every being being that we were created from him and we're essentially borrowing parts of his spirit to live. Um, being that we are a spirit with a temporary body and he has control over what happens to our spirits. Now he's given us free will, but that free will ultimately will either lead us to eternal doom and an absence of his presence which created us or eternal peace which is what he wants for us but we have consistently humans have consistently over time constantly denied him and he brought someone who could restore that which was Jesus and now people still deny that um, that's who Jesus is Jesus is the central point on which everything hinges if Jesus is real then we've got something to consider if he is not real well then humanity is doomed uh, so it's it's very important that we consider Jesus and, and what it represents what he represents um, especially in, in the context of, of other ideas uh, in, in the context of other religions you have to ask the question who is Jesus because He's either just a good prophet, and if he's a good prophet, then he's flawed like the rest of us. Um, and then there's no salvation. And what does that mean? Well, we're all going to hell anyways, um, including the Israelites because they turned against their own their own God, and there's no salvation for them. Um, or he was actually benevolent, and the things that we assumed about him, uh, that, that he just wants us all to go to hell, is wrong. Uh, and that he has been working tirelessly over countless generations to find a way to restore humanity and he has and now it's our choice to deny that or accept it that's who Jesus is um, so if you have any friends any family if you know people who go to church but never read the Bible uh, if you can ask a Christian who is Jesus and they don't have an answer other than he's the Savior and like they can't tell you anything else about him um, they don't know um, so share this information with them like subscribe talk to people about this more than anything talk to people about it everything is important to talk to people about it you you you, you can't have any progress if you refuse to talk to people about the information you've got uh, that's how people remain stagnant that's how people um go to hell quite frankly um they they don't know and they never know and then the people who have the information who have the obligation to share it don't um and that becomes you. Uh, so like, subscribe, share, talk to people about it. Uh, and we'll, we'll find something else to talk about in uh, the next couple of days. So thanks for listening and have a good one.